that there are many questions uh, about this conference since the first time we conducted a liturgical conference way back in 2019. Uh, there were questions. Number one, uh, why is an apologetics group such as the Association of Catholic Apologists uh, conducting a conference on liturgy, specifically on the Eucharist? So that's the first question that I want to address. There are many reasons why an apologetics group is conducting a liturgical conference. First is that I believe and all of our members in the Association of Catholic Apologists believe that if apologists, Catholic apologists, uh, are to fulfill our responsibility to give an explanation to, that, to the hope that is in you, that is in us, uh, as written by our first Pope, St. Peter, then we need to talk about the Eucharist, which is the source of our hope. So, generally, we always tend to defend the doctrines of faith, the doctrines of morals that are held by the Catholic Church. But sometimes we forgot that uh, we tend to, to, as apologists, Catholic apologists, we tend to reduce our faith to statements and formulations. But in reality, we know that our faith is centered on a person. Our faith is centered on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is not a conclusion to syllogisms. It's not a conclusion to minor, major premise, minor premise, and then Jesus Christ's conclusion. Primarily, Jesus Christ is a, is a person. And that person, Jesus Christ, is present in the Eucharist as a, uh, in the most blessed sacrament. And so that is why an apologetics group like us is conducting this particular liturgical conference which is focused on the Eucharist. Second reason is that as Knights of St. Justin Martyr, uh, we are called to spread the devotion to the Holy Eucharist in the same manner that our patron Saint Justin Martyr uh, promoted, wrote letters about the Eucharist, preached about the Eucharist, explained the Eucharist to the Romans, the, the ancient Romans, and uh, promoted the Eucharist to the world around him, to the culture that at that time wasn't as accepting of the faith as it is now. So right now we think that uh, our the, the modern culture is not very accepting of the of our faith, of our Catholic faith. But we can only imagine how. Uh, how much worse it was during the time of Saint Justin Martyr. How much worse it was that they they were being uh, that many Christians were massively uh, killed and martyred for the faith. But aside from that, the devotion to the Eucharist is also in the very identity and the, in, in the history of our organization in the Association of Catholic Apologists. Uh, it is the source of our very existence. In our history, if you, if you know the history of ACA, we, we started as a group who was tra were, were trying to defend the Novus Ordo Missae from ultra-traditionalists like those from our previous organization. And so it is already in our history and our identity to defend the Eucharist and to spread devotion to the Holy Eucharist. But lastly, and this, I think this is most important, as individuals, as individual Catholics, we are the beloved of God. And we also love God in return. That is our fundamental mission. That is our fundamental goal in this life, to grow ever more deeply in love with Christ. And so the last reason why we are conducting this liturgical conference that is focused on the Holy Eucharist is that as lovers of Christ, we can't really stop talking about the one we love. And that is the reason why we're conducting this conference. Even as apologetics group, we're not a, a group focused on liturgy itself. But apologists as Catholics, as Knights of St. Justin Martyr, we're called to talk, to speak loud about the Holy Eucharist. But the second question that I, I received from, from people is this question. 
how are the topics in this conference related to one another? Because uh, this, this is also one of the reasons, uh, the, the question that arose when, when our original speaker tonight asked me if he can reschedule his talk uh, because, of his, uh, because of that emergency. Um, I told him we cannot reschedule aside from the fact that uh, our speakers um, also have their own schedules outside of this surgical conference. But another reason is because of the way our topics is uh, arranged. So first, tonight I'm going to talk about the scriptural basis of the Eucharistic presence. So it's a scriptural basis talking about the, the Bible, the Old Testament, and New Testament. But after that, we're going to have a more uh, a deeper dive into the theology and philosophy of uh, surrounding the mystery of transubstantiation. Tomorrow, uh, given by Father Eddie Fuentes from the Apostolic de Jesus Crucifiso. Uh, after that, after theology and philosophy, uh, we're going to, to learn about some scientific evidence on the real presence of, uh, of Christ in the Eucharist. And that, will, that, will be, that lecture will be given by Sir J. Fernandez. And so in, in those first three topics, for those first three lectures, those lectures will help us understand what the Eucharistic presence is, what it means when Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood. And it also talks about what are the evidence that support the doctrine of the real presence. So those are the first three lectures. And then the last two lectures, which will be given by Sir Juberson in May 26 and myself in May 27. The last two lectures will tell us why the Eucharistic presence is important to us as Catholics, as the Church. My, my lecture will be about the, Eucharist, the Church as the Eucharistic community of persons. And it also, and the, and the lecture by Sir, Sir Juberson is about the personal relationship with Christ in relation to the real presence in the Eucharist. And so it's important in tackling about uh, the, the in, in talking talking about Protestants who are heavy on the idea that they want personal relationship with Christ. So the last lectures will be about those why the Eucharistic presence is important to us. So to begin my presentation today, I want to share one story that recently happened. One time I was invited to the baptism of one relative. And as it always is, as we know, the sacrament of baptism is done within or after the celebration of the Holy Mass. So when priests announce that the, the, the baptisms, that baptism starts at this particular hour, what he really means is that the Eucharistic celebration starts that time and then the sacrament of baptism follows. So we know that from, from experience in, in, in working with the parish. Then an older relative of mine, family member, blood related, knowing that I work closely with the church, asked me this question. Why are priests liars? He said, why do they say that baptism starts at 10 a.m. and then by 10 a.m. they are still celebrating Mass? Why, why don't they just, you know, he said they should announce the exact time that baptism starts. Because, he said, some people do not want to go to Mass. Some people do not want to go to Mass. And to be honest, no words said to me by a family member, by a relative of mine, has ever been more painful. It is excruciating to hear those words. Some people do not want to go to Mass. Certainly many of us, many of you, experience the same experience. Many of you have heard a family member rejecting your invitation to go to Mass. Many of you have sons and daughters or mothers and fathers who say the same thing, who would only go to Mass because you demand that they go with you. Now going back with that relative of mine, after the 
sacrament of baptism and after the mass and the sacrament of baptism I reflected on that experience and I, and I thought if he had known how the angels if they could envy humans would envy us humans that we can receive communion and they cannot Saint, Saint Pope Pius X said that he said, if the angels could envy, they would envy us for Holy Communion. So, I'm not the one who's asserting that. It's, it's also saying, Pope Pius X. But we must understand, most of these people react that way because of ignorance. Let's be honest. It's partly, and most of the, most of the time, it's, part, it's, it's because of ignorance. They say those words because they have eyes but do not see, have ears but do not hear, as we read in Mark 8 verse 18. The same thing is true for people who demand to see miracles before they believe. They would say, to see is to believe. That's a motto that we hear usually from uh, our friends at our age, to see is to believe. By that they mean, I will only believe in God if He reveals Himself to me. I will only believe that Christ is present in the Eucharist if when the priest raises up that bread during consecration, I will see the body of Christ. That's what they really mean. The sad thing is that God already revealed Himself to these people, to us all. And that when they see what they see when the priest raises up the bread during consecration is indeed the body of Christ. In any case, Jesus said to St. Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. The opposite of the motto of most young people today. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. The great patristic father, St. John Chrysostom, once said, you envy the opportunity of the woman who touched the vestments of Jesus, of the sinful woman who washed his feet with her tears, of the women of Galilee who had the happiness of following him in his pilgrimages, of the apostles and disciples who conversed with him familiarly, of the people of the time who listened to the words of grace and salvation which come, came forth from his lips. We call happy those who saw him. But come to the altar and you will see Him. You will touch Him. You will give to Him holy kisses. You will wash Him with your tears. You will carry Him within you like Mary most holy. Close quote. Why is this the case? Why do the saints use such strong language, clear, direct, explicit language to talk about the Eucharist? You will touch Him. Give Him holy kisses. Wash Him with your tears. Carry Him with you. This is true with all the saints. They use languages that are direct, explicit, clear, that when they refer to the Eucharist, they're referring to the person of Christ, to Christ Himself, the totality of the presence of Christ. When they talk about the Eucharist, they refer to Christ Himself, not to a mere symbol or a mere spiritual presence like many of our brothers and sisters believe. They say it is Him, Christ Himself, that you touch, that you kiss, that you carry. The reason why they talk like that is because Christ Himself spoke like that. And the saints are trying to imitate the way Christ speaks, the way Christ acts. And so they speak, they try to, to speak like the, the way that Christ speaks. He refers to the, uh, and, and since he refers to the Eucharist as himself, then the saints also refers to the Eucharist as Christ himself. And every time Christ speaks about the Eucharist, he uses words that are very personal. It is always my body, my blood. It is always that himself that he gives to us so that he may always remain with us until the end of time. Emmanuel, God is with us. And we believe this because Christ, who can neither deceive nor be deceived, revealed it to us. We accept this as a matter of faith. 
Although this Wednesday, Sir J. Fernandez will give a lecture on scientific evidence on the real presence of Christ. We cannot really have definite proof or factual explanation purely based on science. We cannot design a controlled experiment on, that, uh, on this, you know, the real presence of Christ, such that we can manipulate the bread to create flesh, Christ's flesh. We do not have those. If there are scientific evidence, like what, what Sergei is going to discuss this Wednesday, if there are any, it is only because Christ himself revealed himself, Christ himself revealed it was. That's why we call it Eucharistic miracle. Because our science cannot explain that. But we take Jesus at his word because he is the truth. We walk by faith, not by sight, saying all preaches. We believe because it is God who himself who revealed it to us. Saint Cyril of Alexandria wrote, Do not doubt whether this is true, but rather receive the words of the Savior in faith. For since he is truth, he cannot lie. Christ is truth, so he cannot deceive, he cannot lie. Nor can he be deceived in his own self, because he is truth. And so with this, we have to understand what the Eucharist really is. When we, every time we say that, the, that, there, that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, we need to understand what that means. So tomorrow, Father Eddie Fuentes will give us a deeper understanding about this. But I just want to highlight a few things. When we say that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, this is what we mean, as St. Pope Paul VI wrote in Mysterium Fide. He said, and I quote, The presence is called real. It is a substantial presence by which Christ, God and man, makes himself holy and entirely present. So a few things to highlight in that particular quote from Paul VI. Number one, Christ is really present in the Eucharist, not just symbolically. Every time the priest says the body of Christ, it's not just a symbol. During communion, it's not saying the symbol of the body of Christ. No, he means literally it is the body of Christ. Substantially, it is the body of Christ. So it is really Christ's presence in substance. And, and tomorrow we're going to understand much deeper what that word substance means. It may not look like Christ. It may not taste like flesh. The wine may not smell like blood. And if you put it under the microscope, all of the particles, each particle of that hose, of that wine, we will not see flesh or blood if we put it under the microscope. And so we would see that the accidental part, uh, properties remain bread and wine. But in substance, it is Christ himself. And so the second thing that I want to highlight is that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, but that presence is also a hidden presence. It is a hidden presence. St. Paul John Paul the Great declared in the homily back in 1989. He said, The Eucharist is precisely Jesus remaining in our midst in a true and real way. Even if to us He appears under the sacramental signs of bread and of wine, these signs, it is true. Do not allow us the joy of seeing Him with our bodily eyes, but they offer us the assurance of His effective presence. Close quote. What John Paul wants to say is that even though He is hidden from our bodily eyes, it is really Christ whom we see in the Eucharist. And again, as St. Paul preached, we walk by faith, not by sight. We have the certainty of faith that that bread that is raised during the consecration by the priest, that that is Christ himself. And no longer is it substantially bread, even though it, it may look like bread still, but in substance it is now change. But lastly, it is also a, a total presence. 
This is the answer to those who say, if Christ wants us to take His blood, why does the church only give the host for communion? Well, the answer is that what is present in the host is Christ in His entirety. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And consequently, by virtue of the hypostatic union, His whole humanity is also present in that host. Now, we hear people who, who inquire about the faith. Is this doctrine of the real presence of Christ, the Eucharist, scripturally based? And it is that particular question that I want to address in this presentation. My claim is that it is scripturally based, and that is the claim of the Church. The doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is found in the Scriptures. But if by based we mean we can read it word per word, then somehow true but not quite. The formulations and terms used by the Church to explain the doctrine of the real presence of Christ are results of a real development in our understanding of Scripture. But if by base we mean fundamentally and essentially that in its essence it is present in the Scripture, then yes, of course, it is present. We Catholics should not... Uh, just a, a little note here, because uh, usually we tend to... When we do apologetics, many of us Catholic apologists tend to, you know, submit to the demand of the Protestants to see where it is word per word in the Scriptures. But I think, I think we Catholics should not give in to that Protestant temptation of looking for the doctrines of the faith word per word in Scripture. The reason is that we should rather read the Bible using the intellect that God gave us to understand the word of Scripture. We are not machines or robots that fail to understand text within a different formulation even though it has the same meaning. But I believe that this doctrine, by, by its centrality in our faith, is clearly evident in the Scripture. Both uh, the New Testament and some uh, parallelisms in the Old Testament. It is present there and maybe some of us are, are just as extensive and intensive in terms of looking into uh, the Scriptures, where the doctrine is present in the Scripture. So tonight we're going to explore different texts like John 6, the Last Supper narrative, 1 Corinthians, and we can also go back to the Old Testament if we have time to look for parallels in the Israelite version. So the first thing that uh, we should explore when talking about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is the words of promise in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verses 26 to 72. So to quote some, some of those passages in, in the scripture, this is John 6, 51 to 52 and 54 to 57. Christ said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give you is my flesh for the life of the world. Amen, amen, I say unto you, except you eat this, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the, next, in, the, in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Again, John chapter 6, verses 51 to 52, and 54 to 57. So we realize that this text from John chapter 6 is very important in our understanding of the Eucharist. This is a very straightforward text, actually. It, it does not really have much, you know, figurative sense. Much of the John chapter 6 is literal. And in the same chapter, we find how many people of that time, or, or how the people of that time, reacted to Christ's bold claim. So many of them acted, you know, negatively, uh, repulsively to the claim of Christ. So first we have to look at the bold claims of Christ. What did Jesus say and what did He not say? Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. 
If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And again, Jesus means this literally. And actually, the people at, at his time understood it literally compared to, to many of, of the Protestant, uh, many of our Protestant brothers and sisters today who try to understand that passage figuratively. The, the people of the time, at the time of Jesus understood it literally. How is that the case? How do we know that that's the case? They understood it literally because if an Israelite tries to understand the words of Christ in John chapter 6 figuratively, it wouldn't make any sense. It would be difficult to understand. And actually, it, would, it seems like it's nonsense if we try to understand those words figuratively. Why? Because the only figurative reading of the phrase to eat someone's flesh is to persecute, to bitterly hate someone. And so if you use this uh, understanding, this figurative understanding in our reading of John 6, we will have to say that Christ promised His enemies eternal life and a glorious resurrection. It wouldn't make any sense for Christ to promise His enemies salvation and resurrection. But also the phrase to drink someone's blood has chastisement as the only figurative meaning. And so, the same way that, that the phrase to eat someone's flesh doesn't make any sense if, if understood figuratively, it is also the same way that it wouldn't make any sense to understand to drink someone's blood in a figurative sense. So the only understanding, the only correct understanding that we can that we can uh, use is the literal understanding of the text because the the, uh, the figurative meaning does not does not really hold any water does not really make any sense and in fact we know it based on the reaction of the people at the time of Christ it is that literal reading or that literal understanding of some of the Jews in verse 53 that caused the reaction. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's the reaction of the Jews in verse 53. So they were actually surprised and, and you know, questioning why? How can this man expect us to eat his own flesh? You know, literally. And then Jesus replied, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you shall not have life in you. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And by the way, if we look into the words that Jesus used in the original Greek, we would see a shift in the words used when the Jews started expressing disbelief and even repulsiveness. So for example, in John chapter 6 verses 50 to 53, the words used by Christ in the Greek uh, is the Greek word uh, phago, which literally means eating. But after Jews reacted negatively, like for example in verse 53, they, they questioned, how can this man give, a, give us his flesh to eat? Jesus Christ did not say, but I meant it figuratively. I meant, you know, it's a spiritual, you, you eat my symbol, you eat the symbol of my body. Jesus did not say any of that. So there's no scriptural evidence to understand, to understand the, the scripture, the, the text in John 6 as something figurative. What Jesus said instead is to, uh, what Jesus used instead is a more graphic term. So instead of using the Greek term for eating, he used the, the term trogo, which means to chew on. Chew. Nguya. And so this is used, this term is actually used when an animal is ripping apart its prey. So there's a shift in the language use of Christ from simply eating to chew chewing. So it's more graphic 
what, what Jesus Christ is really saying there is that you have to understand this is not something figurative. And if you think that eating is, all, is a term that is, you know, difficult to accept, then it is difficult to accept because really, for you people, it would be difficult to understand. And so this literal understanding and the use of graphic terms is what caused the disciples to say in verse 61, this saying is hard. And in verse 66, John, uh, the beloved the evangelist wrote, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer were, uh, walked with him. Close quote. But we have to understand that this doctrine is really a stumbling block for many people. Especially those of other faith, not those of the Catholic faith. But even some in, in, in the Catholic Church, there are some who doubt the, real, the doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. It is difficult for these people to understand this message, but we know that it is also an opportunity because it is a test of our faith. And it was actually the Catholics who passed the test. When asked, do you want to go as well? Our first Pope, St. Peter, replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Close quote. And so in the face of uncertainty, St. Peter held on to the words of Jesus, to what Jesus really meant, not to what the disciples wanted Jesus to mean. Those are different. There, there is a big difference between what Jesus is really saying and really means and to what we want Jesus to mean and say. So, we understand that it is difficult to accept that for, for many people. But at least we understand that it is certain. And it is certain because Christ, the truth, who can neither deceive nor be deceived, revealed it. And we also understand that Christ never fails. In John chapter 6, it was the promise, the words of promise. And those words of promise by Christ in John 6 was fulfilled in the words of institution in the Last Supper narrative. When He promised in John chapter 6, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world, He fulfilled that promise in the Last Supper when He said, This is my body given up for you. This is my blood shed for you. And this sacrifice of Christ in the Last Supper is consummated on the cross during Good Friday. And again, this, every words of Christ, every time He talks about the Eucharist, it is always literally said, not figuratively meant. In fact, the necessity to understand this literally forced even the father of Protestantism, Martin Luther, to write in 1524, Martin Luther wrote, I am caught, I cannot escape. The text is too forcible. So what Martin Luther is really saying is that I do not have any valid explanation or valid defense to the figurative understanding of the text in John 6. But aside from the words uttered by Christ as written by the disciples, we can also look into how the early Christians treat the consecrated body of bread and wine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, St. Paul wrote that receiving the consecrated bread and wine is a serious matter. This is what he meant when he wrote, He that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. So meaning, this consecrated body, uh, this consecrated bread and wine, which is the body and blood of Christ, is a serious matter for the early Christians. If you have sinned against God, if you have sinned greatly, then you should not eat, you should not partake in the, in the communion, in the Holy Communion. Why? Because the, the, what we receive in communion is not just a symbol, but it is the real presence of Christ. And so we, we, we say that 
you can say that it's not even just written the written words of the disciples or the written records of the words that came from Jesus' mouth. It is also in the way that these people treated the Holy Eucharist before that we understand that this is not just bread and wine anymore. This is so much greater. That we can say with Jesus, there is something greater than the temple here every time we go to Mass. So that's uh, the explanation from John 6, uh, and then the Last Supper narrative, and then from the First Corinthians, uh, which is written by St. Paul. But we can also explore uh, how the people from the Old Testament understood this particular, uh, how the, the Jews, the Israelites, could have understood the Eucharist if they were present in the Last Supper. So, I want to start here. We always hear the formulation from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This formulation, I think most of us are familiar with this. CCC says, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. We always hear that formulation every time we talk about, especially when we talk about Marian dogma, where we use typology, is parallelism, Mary is the new covenant, uh, new art of the covenant, I mean, and Mary is the new Eve. And so we also have to recognize that we can use, we can see the Eucharist in that light. Not just the fact uh, of the sacrifice or a sacred meal, but also the real presence of God in the Eucharist. This we see in what the Jews call bread of the face or the bread of the presence. I recommend you read the book by Brad Petrie called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. This is the book that I use to explore uh, the, the how, how the Jews, how the Israelites can read the Last Supper narrative. It's a great book. So, when God told Moses to make a tabernacle, the tent of meeting, it is written in the scripture. God instructed Moses to make three sacred objects to be kept inside of that tabernacle, that tent of meeting. These are, first, the Ark of the Covenant, Second, the golden lampstand or the menorah. And third, the golden table of the bread of presence. And this is described in Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 to 24 and 29 to 30. This is what's written there. This is God talking to Moses. And you shall make a table of the kasha wood. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. And you shall make its plates and dishes for incense, and its flagons and bowls with which to pour libations. Of pure gold you shall make them, and you shall set the bread of presence on the table before me always." Close quote. So this text from Exodus is important because it shows some similarities with the Christian worship with how we do the Mass. In the Jewish worship, they have flagons and bowls for pouring libations. Libations are sacrificial drink, uh, offerings of wine. Those are wines that they offer, and that's called libations. And this wine is unlike the other wine offerings, because other wine offerings are poured out from the cup. But this one, the wine that is placed in the flagons and bowls, are not poured out. Rather, what is done is that the priest drink the wine inside those flagons and bowls in a sacred meal of bread and wine. Very similar. Also, the bread of presence, if you look to Hebrew, to the Hebrew language, is actually translated to the bread of face. Thus, Dr. Brand Petrie, the writer of this book, concludes, the bread of presence is nothing less than the bread of the face of God. In this view, somehow, the bread itself is a visible sign of the face of God. 
talks about the presence of God. And also worth noting is the fact that the bread of presence was first given to the Israelites immediately after the heavenly banquet, after the meal. So Exodus 24 verses 9 to 11 says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw God of Israel, the God of Israel. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. So what Exodus, uh, Exodus 24 is trying to really say here is that when they were eating and drinking, they saw God. Why? Because the bread of presence makes God present to the people. The bread and wine of the presence. More than that, in Leviticus, so it's not only in Exodus, it's also in Leviticus, the bread of presence was also considered the bread of the everlasting covenant. It is written, and I quote, this is Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5 to 7. And you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes of it, and you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, upon the table of pure gold. And you shall put pure frankincense with each row, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion to be offered by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall set it in order before the Lord continually on behalf of the sons of Israel as an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the offerings by fire to the Lord of our temple too. So again, this is Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5 to 7. The bread of presence is the sign of the everlasting covenant between God and Israel. It was said to be a perpetual offering. It was also a sacrifice, an unbloody sacrifice, since in the Old Testament, there are two types of sacrifices, the bloody sacrifice and an unbloody sacrifice. So this type of sacrifice is an unbloody sacrifice. Like the Eucharist, this bread of presence is both a meal and a sacrifice. A meal because it was a gift from God to His priests. A sacrifice because it is an offering of the priests to their God. So here we, we say a sort of, we see a sort of dialogue exchange between the priest of God and God Himself, where God gives the priests the bread of presence as a meal for the for the meal of these priests. But also the priest offers that meal to God as a sacrifice. And this sacrifice is also a most holy sacrifice to be offered up every Sabbath day. So it's most holy because they offer it up every Sabbath day. And this unbloody sacrifice that is offered is nothing but the bread and wine of the presence. So what they offer in this most holy sacrifice are the bread and uh, wine of the presence. So we can go so much deeper into the Old Testament parallelisms. We can go to Melchizedek even. So here in the book, there were also explanations on uh, parallelisms with Melchizedek as the high priest and Jesus Christ uh, offering uh, his body and blood through the bread and wine of the Last Supper. Since Christ is also the high priest. So we can go much deeper into the Old Testament parallelisms. But for now, I'll cut it short so that we can have more time for questions and dialogue since uh, dialogue is much less boring than a monologue given by me. <laughs> and so in summary, here are the parallelisms between the bread and wine of presence in the Old Testament and the bread and wine during the Last Supper in the New Testament. So number one, in the bread of presence, there are 12 gates to represent the 12 tribes. In the Last Supper, there are 12 disciples to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. In the old, the bread and wine is the bread and wine of God's presence to His people, Israel. In the New Testament, it is the bread and wine of Jesus' presence, the real presence of Jesus, 
Third, the bread of presence uh, is referred to as everlasting covenant in the Old Testament. And in the Last Supper, it, the bread and wine in the Last Supper is referred to as the new covenant since it is already the body and blood of Christ. For the bread of presence is offered as a remembrance in the Old Testament. And the same thing is true in the Last Supper that it is offered in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Fifth, the bread of presence is offered by high priests and eaten by priests. And during the Last Supper, it was Jesus, the high priest, who offered and then the disciples ate. The last one is that the bread of presence is eaten at the golden table in Jerusalem temple. And then in the Last Supper, and then the Last Supper was eaten in Jesus' table in the kingdom of the Father. And so every time we go to Mass, therefore, we must realize and say to Jesus, again, something greater than the temple is here. It is not just the bread and wine of presence that was given to the Israelites. Here, it is something more, something greater. Because in Jesus, the bread of wine and wine ceased to become the symbol of God's presence. In Jesus, the bread and wine became His real presence. St. Cyril of Alexandria wrote, as we can read in his mystagogical catechesis, he said, he wrote, and I quote, In the Old Testament, also there was the bread of the presence. But this, as it belonged to the Old Testament, has come to an end. But in the New Testament, there is bread of heaven and a cup of salvation, sanctifying soul and body. Consider, therefore, the bread and wine not as bare elements, for they are, according to the Lord's declaration, the body and blood of Christ. For even though sense suggests this to you, yet let faith establish you. Judge not the matter from the taste, but from faith. Be fully assured without misgiving that the body and blood of Christ has been vouched safe to you. And so it's not just our present day understanding of the scripture, John chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, Last Supper, and then the parallelisms in the Old Testament. It's not just our current understanding of the scripture. It is also the understanding of our early church fathers, the early Christians, those who, who know and knew the, the apostles of Christ. And certainly those people who learned from the students of Christ. And so we can have certainty, not, not just scripturally uh, in, in the way we understand the scripture, but also we can check whether our understanding of the scripture today is the same as the understanding of the early church fathers during the time of the apostles and the time after the apostles. So the next time we go to Mass, let us remember this discussion. Let us glorify God who gave Himself fully and really to us. Let us thank Him for His generosity to the point of giving totally Himself for us. And let us ask Him to constantly stay with us. A story from St. Faustina talks about Christ leaving the convent of the religious sisters because some of the sisters are not trying to live holy lives. Imagine this is a convent. And Jesus says, I'm leaving because some of the sisters are not living holy lives. And many times St. Faustina saw Jesus leaving the tabernacle. The sacred host there literally jumps out of the tabernacle. And Jesus explained to St. Faustina why he was leaving. And he was leaving because again, some of the sisters are not living holy lives. St. Faustina, however, had this holy stubbornness, if that is a term that we can use, holy stubbornness. She picked up the host and returned it to the tabernacle, saying to Jesus something of this sort, I will not allow you to leave the convent. And every time Jesus tries to jump out of the tabernacle and leave the convent, St. Faustina would pick the host, put it back into the tabernacle and, and say something of the sort, I will not allow you to leave the convent. And so, in the end, Jesus stayed in the convent because of that holy stubbornness of St. Faustina, because of her faith that it is really Jesus in that post in the tabernacle 
and that he does not want Jesus to leave the convent because it would mean also leaving St. Faustina alone in the convent. And St. Faustina, like all the saints, did what Christ asked St. Margaret Mary Alaco. When Christ said, Behold this heart which so loved men, it has spared nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself in order to testify to his love. So I will end with this, and I hope that we will all reflect on this quote from uh, St. John, uh, St. Pope John Paul the Great. This is from a homily he gave in 1988. John Paul said, Christ remained in our midst not only during the Mass, but also afterwards, under the species reserved in the Tabernacle. The Eucharistic worship extends throughout the whole day without being limited to the celebration of the sacrifice. He is a God who is near, a God who waits for us, a God who has chosen to remain with us. When one has faith in the real presence, how easy it is to be close to Him, adoring the love of loves. How easy it is to understand the expressions of love with which throughout the centuries, Christians have surrounded the Eucharist. Close quote. So that ends my discussion, and uh, maybe to end this discussion, we can pray. Come, O oh Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.